Okay, everybody, it's about 1.01 here, Central Daylight Time. Can't believe I'm saying that here almost at the start of April. Uh, but it's that time of year again, and we're starting the 15th year of the Warning Operation course. This year is a little bit different in that we're starting it much earlier than than we've ever started. And we've also got a lot of materials already in the CLC. Uh, more people are taking it probably than ever. Uh, we're also offering quite a bit of new material in terms of new online content and instructor-led training. Uh, and we're kind of ending some of the on, uh, the direct facilitation earlier than we've ever ended it due to budget uh, constraints. Nonetheless, uh, it's time to get started, and uh, se severe weather season is right on our door, and uh, we look forward to doing this again for you. Uh, just to start off, uh, a little bit about me. I'm the uh, project lead for uh, the Walk Severe, and I've been doing this a number of years. Walk is typically taken uh, after the radar application course. When we first started, uh, it was a new course, and so everyone took it. And then every year, pretty much since probably 2006 or seven, uh, average 100 people have been taking it. And really, in the last five years, probably uh, you know an additional 20 to 30 people are taking parts of the course. That's the parts that have been updated. However, it's changed quite a bit, and from the first iteration, it still is comprised of the three primary uh, uh, parts of warning decision-making in an operational environment, that being knowledge of the science, use of the technology, and working through the human factors and all the interdisciplinary uh, components involved with that and decision-making. Uh, and so, unlike RAC, uh, the radar application course, which is focused primarily on the use of radar products for uh, warning and forecast, the warning operation course in, encompasses or utilizes all types of uh, uh, sensors, technology, uh, and, 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 and gets into quite a bit more of the human aspect of decision making in, in the uh, Warning services. So, uh, with that being said, we'll get going and go on to the next slide. And the next slide just kind of illustrates a uh, kind of a progression of where the warning operation course curricula is contained in the development of a warning forecaster. You kind of start off at the ground level per se of the of the learning pyramid with the foundational training and, and courses that address primarily use of various sensors and uh, components and technology, such as the ADAD and, of course, the radar course, IDSS is contained near the foundation satellite course, MRMS. These are all systems uh, that are important to understand how they work, the strengths and limitations of each of the product suite, uh, but then the, the next iteration up beyond that, if you don't know how to use it to perform a specific service, then it's just knowledge, and so that's why the warning operation course uh, tracks are located here in the middle part, the blue part of the pyramid. And then as you progress, uh, as someone you know continues to take this training, there's a need obviously to uh, maintain a proficiency with uh, at a com working at a competent level in warning operations, and that's where we have elements of the course included in part of the seasonal readiness training package and, and uh, tool set. So that's kind of how it all fits together, and uh, we are evolving kind of the pyramid as we as we go forward in time, but for now, you're in the middle, and you're taking the Warrant Operations course severe in core. Some of you may have taken winter or finished up on winter, and also some of you may be taking the green flash flood. Uh, for this orientation session, since we, we do instructor-led training and there's some specific components of the course starting now with the Indian Iraq, we focus on severe and core. That's me. I got I got a couple. I don't want to kill these lines and get. I don't know what. Um... Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Uh, the the uh, the walk uh, contains multiple modes of instruction. We use web-based training, obviously instructor-led training using GoToMeeting and West 2 simulations. We also uh, use a forecast challenge. The forecast challenge is a gamified activity which allows you to compete with your 
fellow forecasters to uh, accurately forecast severe weather, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we also use uh, uh, things in VLab for blogging, posting just-in-time training on Facebook and Twitter to communicate with social media with our customers as well. So we kind of uh, do a lot of communication to facilitate this course, a lot of emails. It takes a lot of work to uh, to, uh, to pull off the, the walk. And visually, uh, the FY18 Walk Severe and Core Curricula is illustrated with this uh, table. Across the top, you can see the six distinct curricula, uh, starting on the left with core decision making, and each of the sale blocks are a individual course within the curricula. So uh, you can you can see that each uh, each of the curricula contains a, anywhere from you know 45 minutes to 10 hours, based on the based on the uh, the composition. Core decision making uh, has quite a bit new for FY18, including new modules in situational awareness and decision making, warning environment, uh, and so uh, moving on down from that, uh, and, uh, we get uh, the convective fundamentals, which includes the forecast challenge and the debrief webinars, a new module on the total lighting and convective line models, uh, a really uh, important topic and rather new in terms of the extensive application and the variety of, uh, of convective line models in the severe weather forecast and warning process, and then lifting mechanisms. Then we get into tornado. We have tornado forecasting, SPC videos, tornado warning guidance. We have hailstorms. So you can kind of see how the, the different curricula are designed based on specific hazard once you get past the convective fundamentals. I'd like to mention the QLCS curriculum because it does contain two new lessons on QLCS middle vortex detection, recognition and detection for tornado warnings, two parts based on the three ingredients methodology. And uh, the impact-based warnings also contains new exercises on how to use uh, the, uh, the uh, for a given case, the uh, storm structure and the environment when presented with a situation, what type of tag would be best uh, applied for the situation. And so uh, that's kind of, in a nutshell, the entire curricula in one image. Uh, a person who wishes to receive a completion certificate needs to attend one of the core root cause analysis and structure-led training sessions, which is in this, uh, in this unit here. One severe ILT on the mesoscale analysis in warning decisions and one forecast challenge debrief, uh, and in addition to completing a West simulation, which we'll talk about. So those are the requirements, and that's everything kind of uh, encapsulated in one one uh, image. Okay, a little bit about the individual uh, tracks now. The core, again, is uh, focuses on approximately nine hours of training material on topics relevant to warning decision making. Not specifically tied to a uh, hazard or warning type. There are four uh, different uh, instructional components in addition to the orientation on, in the core track covering topics such as situational awareness, navigating the warning environment, expertise and post warnings, and crisis communication and social media. So you click on one of these uh, blue uh, titles in the, uh, in the uh, core curriculum, and that will take you to some details of what's contained in the uh, in the curriculum itself. So, for example, under expertise and post mornings, after you get down to that, and by the way, you want to probably take these somewhat in, somewhat in sequence within a curriculum, but you can move in and out and take uh, instructional components simultaneously within severe and core. So, if you click on the expertise and post mortems unit within the block core, you can see that there are six individual items in there, including the, uh, these are all uh, uh, web-based training modules, and then under the RCA uh, root cause analysis webinar, one of these is required. You click on that and you'll get the uh, uh, a discussion on how to perform root cause analysis. These other ones are kind of background material. Uh, it's very short, but the RCA webinar is required to attend one of those, and you'll also be presented with three assignments, which the rock core students will need to complete uh, to complete the walk core track. So the dates for the walk core ILTs assignment inf information, that's, everyone always wants to know that because you have to sign up for these. You click on that, uh, 
select session button to the right of the description of the FY18 walk, walk root cause analysis webinar. That takes you to a list of all the available sessions that you can sign up for. There's four available. Seats are, are, are numbered here, so you can see some of the, the first one is already filling up, but if you have a preference, go ahead and request that. You'll get the GoToWebinar information, and uh, uh, you know, one hour prior to that, you'll you'll receive the GoToWebinar uh, information to the event. And once you get into the RCA, you'll get a discussion for how the RCA process works. You'll work through one example, and then you'll get an assignment for three others. Once you uh, once you do that, uh, you'll get something that looks a little bit like this, which is. Uh, uh, a step-by-step -step process once you complete the webinar. You log into the LMS, open your transcript, open the core curriculum, select the Manage link in the Options column, uh, scroll down to the Post Work uh, region and click the Activate link for the first exercise. And uh, once the exercise has been, has been activated, you click on the Launch link for the first exercise to launch the course. So the exercise course is basically a couple of pages which has the instructions for how to complete the assignment and how to submit the exercise to the WDT instructors and, and, and all. It'll be fairly self-explanatory. There'll be a one-question quiz requiring you to enter a passcode, so copy and paste the passcode sent by the instructor into the text box and click the submit button to complete the quiz. If you enter the correct passcode, you get completion for the quiz and be marked complete. So you repeat the steps for the same same steps for the two other RCA exercises, and that's pretty much how you you do the RCA uh, exercises. So those are always a lot of fun. You get to apply the, the technique for events in your office, uh, either a severe weather event or a, or some other type of event where you're getting to the root of the problems. So those are the RCA assign, uh, assignments. Now for the walk severe, these are all the individual items or instructional components. The orientation, of course, you're taking now. We're going to add a, the uh, the recorded one as well that you can if you miss this. Uh, the convective fundamentals, you can click on each of these and it opens up all the individual elements within the uh, within the uh, instructional component. Uh, don't worry about the date there. These these are all up to date. Yeah. And then for the debrief webinar, you click on one of those, and that takes you to the options for the debrief webinar as well as the hazard webinar. So uh, we'll, uh, when we get to the debrief webinar, I'll explain those a little bit in detail. But for the hazard webinars, you, uh, I've got five of those scheduled between now, between April 4th and the end of June. Those are really important. Again, ten, one of those, I'll be repeating the same concepts and the, and most of the same cases in each of the subsequent sessions, but it's required to attend one of those. The focus of these will be on the use of mesoanalysis in warning decision making. So they're new cases and a slightly different twist than in the past where we've focus strictly on the use of radar data. This is much more looking at the satellite model data uh, and observations to determine the environment and, and how it supports, you know, uh, subsequent severe weather decision. I hate that uh, echo reverb. All right, severe forecast challenge is a big part of the uh, of the walk severe. There's also a national forecast challenge. We've got Chris Benago here to help with any other additional questions, but I'll just kind of run through kind of the the highlights of the uh, uh, of the forecast challenge. For, you must the minimum bare minimum requirements are forecasting at least twice per week for three of the ten weeks. How long does it last, and what is a week? What constitutes a week? Well, it runs from April 15th to June 23rd, and a week is essentially defined as Sunday through Saturday. So those are the 10 weeks. So the minimum requirements are at least twice per week for three of the 10 weeks, so not, not too difficult. You must forecast by 16Z on the day of the forecast, and the forecast is for severe weather that occurs between the 19Z through 11.59 on the next day. And that's how it pretty much runs. Top two scores from each week will be counted, so there's no penalty for multiple uh, forecasts, forecasting every day. And in fact, the more you forecast, typically the better you get. And for any given, any given pattern, generally speaking, sometimes the forecast at the end of your cycle are the best terms because you're, you're familiar with the situation. 
You must submit a forecast discussion explaining your reasoning, and I'll show you an example of that. The reason that's important is just so that you won't blankly follow uh, a, uh, you know, another forecast that's been issued, like from SPC. We want you to learn from, uh, you know, uh, severe weather forecast methodology, uh, looking at uh, patterns, ingredients, and, and uh, putting them together to forecast uh, location. Also, a little bit of dose of local climatology is important. Uh, you also must attend at least one of five forecast challenge debrief webinars and issue a forecast for the day of the session on which you attend. And we'll talk a little bit about those coming up. Uh, to get started on this, uh, Chris needs a username at the Walk Severe Forecast Challenge uh, selection form. I've hyperlinked this uh, and provided this as a handout for your webinar. So if, if you can't get to this, uh, uh, look at your handout and make sure you go to this and and enter a username. If you want to do the national, there's also a uh, option there to use the same uh, your same username for the national, since uh, it's essentially the same same challenge. It's just uh, the walk severe. We have the forecast challenge debriefs, and we provide the feedback. Uh, and so that's kind of a you know a little little different, I guess. But in terms of the scoring and everything else, I think it's all pretty much the same, right, Chris? Right, it scores exactly the same way. Just the, the only difference is the Walk Severe one is only open to those enrolled in Walk Severe. Yeah, right. Thanks. And uh, and so it's a little slightly different user interface when you go to the website. But uh, so what does it look like? Speaking of the website, uh, uh, well, the first thing you want to do is make a forecast. And and this, I'm not going to go into how to make a forecast in the orientation session, but using what you've learned during the course, uh, starting off with uh, observed analysis, you kind of make a uh, diagnos diagnosis of the uh, situation and prog out, you know, what you think, where you think severe weather will be occurring uh, at a specific lo location. And so you, 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 you uh, need to rely heavily on, on mesoscale analysis, synoptic analysis, uh, the influence of lifting mechanisms, parameter evaluation, pattern recognition, all the, everything kind of goes into that. Uh, uh, and, and, and there's some, definitely some lessons in the, uh, the walk severe, which kind of get into that, but that's, that's kind of where it starts. We don't want you to just go right to the SPC, uh, day two or day one and, and use the severe weather probabilities to put your, I mean, you can use that obviously, but, you know, start with your, uh, with, uh, with an, with uh, your own observational analysis and, and, uh, and, you know, in terms of time frame, I know you're working, you're doing all this while you're on shift, uh, so, you know, you're not going to have six hours to devote to make a forecast. If you do, that's great, but most people spend, you know, 15, 30 minutes on on this. And if you're up on the situation and and you're kind of aware of the large-scale pattern, you can you can zoom in uh, and, and really uh, kind of do a kind of a regional funnel analysis and, and find have a pretty good bet where severe weather is going to occur. The, the tricky part is obviously an exact location where you, where you you will get a report because it's all verified by an actual report. So it's uh, it's, it's a legitimate forecast challenge. So, uh, it's kind of like uh, at least in college they used to have the uh, the uh, forecast uh, challenge uh, in uh, uh, in college when I was in school they. They did that, and you picked a location. You had to you had to predict severe or uh, predict the weather at these locations. So it was kind of based on that, and we've been doing it a number of years. Uh, you do have a, a website uh, that you log on to, uh, and uh, that leg, uh, website once you enter your username and password, your LDAP password, it'll spawn a window that looks kind of like this, which will say "Welcome to the Walk Severe Forecast Challenge." You'll click on "Submit a Forecast." Button that will take you to a another little interface where you'll you'll put your you'll drop a pin on your lat lawn location of where you expect your severe weather to occur, and it'll also be the window where you put you know where you're going to do hail, wind, or tour, and then write your discussion and you hit submit, and that puts gets, puts it in the database, and uh, at the end of the day or the next day, uh, you'll have a there'll be a map that you can pull up by clicking on the on the map. The latest forecast, and and that'll list all the forecasts, all the pins, color coded by specific hazards. So if you issued for uh, D 
damaging winds there along the Georgia-Florida border there, west of Jacksonville, north of Tallahassee. This person uh, did a wind forecast, and there's, a, there's their uh, discussion. So we want you to put a kind of a description for why you think uh, that severe weather threat is going to occur in that area, mentioning the, the key factors, you know, moisture instability and lift. Uh, it doesn't have to be a hemispheric discussion, just, you know, cover the moisture instability myth, uh, uh, moisture instability and lifting mechanisms. So you might mention, you know, forecast cave values, uh, uh, any type of a, uh, local response from climatology, uh, storm motion. So we're looking for things like that. Uh, and and we're, we're kind of checking for scientific accuracy and, and, uh, and, and, and it, it's a good practice for learning how to write a, uh, a forecast discussion. It really is good. When you start verbalizing your thought process, it kind of crystallizes, uh, you know, how you're, how you're thinking and your, and your forecast process. So that's uh, an example. And we'll post all the latest forecasts and so that you can pull up and see what other people have done, uh, and, and, and where they forecast. And, and that kind of gives us a way to kind of see everyone, what they're doing. We kind of use that as well to, in the forecast debriefs to kind of look at what are, where people are forecasting. We'll maybe uh, pick, we can't do everyone's forecast if there's like, you know, 60 forecasts on a day. But if there's some that's like really way out in left field, we might call on that person and say, hey, why'd you forecast a tornado in Maine? You know, what was your, your reasoning there? And, uh, and, and we'll talk about that. And then there's the uh, standings. You click on the latest standings, and you'll see how many correct forecasts and the total score. And it changes day by day and week by week. Weekly standings are updated, and uh, Chris and Steve and the guys are really good at updating the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the website, tabulating the standings, and how the forecast challenge is going through the 10 weeks. Uh, we do provide uh, limited feedback on the forecast sessions, like I said, just to kind of uh, check for scientific relevancy and consistency. We're not going to, you know, say, where'd you come up with that? We're not questioning your analysis, but just, you know, we're trying to give you some pointers. Like, you know, did you consider decay? If you put a wind forecast and you didn't mention decay or anything about downdraft strength, we might say, well, what did decay say? If you forecast tornado to occur and you didn't mention anything about LCL height or, uh, or low level shear, we might just say, hey, did, did this, did this come into play? You know, some, this is something to consider, uh, storm relative listing, things like that. So usually it's, it's, it's beneficial. Feedback is always good, uh, to the students when they, when they issue a forecast. You also might ask, uh, a, a fellow, uh, forecaster in your office, you know, when you come up, hey, do you think, um, am I think on the right page here or am I missing something? Uh, when we do the feedback on at least one of the discussions during the course of the challenge. So, you know, if, if I think there is a button at the uh, submission, and Chris, correct me, isn't there a button they can choose to sele uh, uh, select if they want to get a uh, feedback on that discussion? Yep, that's right. So that way they'll get feedback on something that they actually put a lot of thought into instead of just let's yeah. randomly pick in a day. Right, so pick one that you're really proud of or you ought to put a lot of thought in and we'll, we'll provide feedback on that one. There are some days, understand that, you know, I've been in the same boat where you only have five, ten minutes to get a forecast out, so you don't have a lot of time to develop a well thought out forecast discussion, so we understand that. So on those days, uh, you know, deselect that uh, requesting feedback. Uh, you do need to make sure you have a discussion, otherwise we throw it out. Uh, in terms of the uh, the challenge perks uh, and the uh, the reward system, if you forecast at least twice per week for six of the ten weeks, and again above the bare minimum, you will get a uh, WDDD T-shirt as shown, and also the top three point finishers will receive plaques commemorating their achievement. And again, it's something that is uh, well deserved and and, and good attribute and recognition for. Uh, for a good job in doing the forecast challenge. And hopefully you'll take what you've learned and, and use that to improve your forecast as well. But that's, uh, that's really a nice perk and something to uh, shoot for as you go through the forecast challenge. In terms of some of the scoring details, I won't cover all this because it's in the, covered in the forecast rules, but essentially points are based on a, uh, 
distance requirement from the, the, uh, the nearest LSR in the SPC database. Uh, you can forecast none if, it, if you think it's a null event, if no severe weather will occur anywhere in the continental U.S., and I think you get uh, maybe up to, uh, I want to say, 15 points for that, or I can't remember for sure, but uh, anyway, there's there's a chance. Because one time we had a forecast challenge in the dead of summer and late into July, and there wasn't a lot of severe weather on some days, so uh, that can't happen. But you can always fall back on Florida. And working on Florida, I remember it was very rare that you didn't have at least one severe weather report in the warm season. So if you're really good at forecasting uh, intersecting outflow boundaries, sea breeze, and, and want to take a shot at that, you go, for, go for Florida. But again, the, uh, the returns may not be uh, as great on that. Uh, and then slide here, I won't go through all that, but you kind of see how the distance score is computed, 100 minus the distance to the closer report and additional points, again, for uh, the, the closer you're at, you, you get to the actual report. So if you really nail it, you can get up to 50 points. Plus, uh, uh, some bonus points are awarded if a SIG severe occurs, SIG being greater than 60 knots or greater than 2-inch hail, and additional points for successful uh, tornado forecast, and that's, those are rare events, so we kind of give you some bonus points, and it's always good to go for the gusto in the, uh, for the tornado, but again, those are tough uh, to, uh, to forecast ahead of time. And then the debrief webinars, we start these up in April, and uh, you must attend at least one of these on the day you forecasted, and we'll call on participants to review forecast and discuss reasoning. These last approximately one hour. If there's no severe weather that day, then, then we'll, we'll review a significant weather event from the previous week. Uh, the, uh, any questions on, this, on the forecast challenge before I move on? All right, we'll move on to the weather event simulator, simulation requirement, basically a three-step process to complete the WES uh, simulation. The first step is getting a DVD containing the data. And if you have not received the DVD for the, uh, the WES severe case that we developed in 2016, uh, then, then, uh, then notify me, and I'll make sure you, you have an updated uh, DVD with the WESL in install scripts. Uh, and you can just send me an email or, or tell me at the end of the session if you if you if you don't have one. So you load the you load the case in the West Two Bridge uh, machine. You load up the case. Uh, you go through the simulation. You make some warning decisions. You look at the environmental assessment. Uh, you pull up on a uh, a PC or laptop. Uh, answer some questions on in, on the environmental assessment and on some of your uh, decision-making uh, rationale for a few of the a few of the decision points, uh, and then you do a debrief with your uh, facilitator, your Sue, or whoever's helping you go through the course. Discuss what you know, what you did, how you did, what were some of your uh, learning successes, what are what were some of your you know your learning gaps that you still have. In other words, you might say, well, I don't understand. I don't know what what happened here. Or, What's going on? Let's review this particular decision point, or let's uh, let's review this aspect. The, the simulation is essentially, essentially uh, three phases. Phase one is environmental assessment, where it's in uh, uh, case review mode. Then you can put it in a simulation mode for phase two, which runs for about two hours. And then phase three is essentially kind of a IDSS type question uh, for uh, for convective trends. And, and, and basically answering, you know, a couple of questions about, uh, about precip. Uh, so the whole thing you can knock out in a couple of hours and, uh, or you can, you can run it longer if you need to. But that's the West simulation. We're also working on a new one to ship out. And if you have a local simulation that you would like to complete as part of the simulation requirement, let me know and we'll work out a workaround for how we track that and keep track of that. Cause currently you have to go into the, uh, uh, a, uh, a Google form to answer, uh, you know, answer the questions. Of course, if you have a different simulation, you won't be answering the same questions, but I would still like to have some verification of what you've done if you're doing a different locally developed simulation. Uh, so once you get that simulation form, 
uh, opened up and you answer it, you'll just hit submit. The, the, the values will go into a little spreadsheet. I'll, I'll see all your answers. And, uh, and then you just basically log into the LMS and uh, launch the little test on the severe simulation icon within your curriculum. The quiz is just basically a one question uh, item asking you if you completed the simulation and filled out the information in the online form. You hit save. Uh, I will get notified then and grade the answer form uh, in the LMS and you'll get confirmation you've completed that particular element. So that's how it works, three-step process. It's pretty straightforward. If you're doing, a, again, a local simulation, contact me and we'll work out a verification policy so that you can complete something and go in there and, and, and validate that you've actually done a simulation. Since the requirements are to do a simulation, if you're doing a different one, like if you're in an Anchorage and you want to do a, an Anchorage simulation with, uh, with whatever, uh, you can do that. Um, but just let me know what you, what you want to do. But you do have to do one that's in your, that's in your curriculum. So to find, to sum it all up, after you do everything, complete all items in your CLC course curricula, uh, you'll get a kind of a 100% thing that pops up that looks kind of like this. And we use that to kind of validate that you're you're done with everything, uh, and then we'll send out a course certificate. We want you to make sure you do that. In addition, uh, watch for course event messages through email. Uh, check our website for additional details, and very important, make sure that you complete the post course evaluation. We'll be sending that out typically two to three weeks after the course is completed. We want to, we're wanting to measure what parts you found most useful and that you're actually using in your operations. It's not a true uh, level three evaluation, but it's more of a kind of measuring your learning recall and what you've, what you're, what you've been able to retain in terms of a uh, training use perspective. And then the event calendar, we're running this thing again for the next three months all the way to the end of June. Uh, the West Simulation Completion Requirement will extend that through the end of the summer because we do know that takes time. Plus, when we send out a new simulation, You'll need a little time to complete that as a chance, but we'll be tracking through the end of June, and at which point then we start FY19 development. Uh, and, uh, and again, the webinars, sign up for the severe webinars, the forecast challenge, and, uh, and again, this is for core and severe. Uh, and we'll be running that through the end of June. So it's a lot. Uh, just, just as some uh, lessons learned, I find that people that can do at least uh, three to four hours of training per week, they can get it done. If you wait until, uh, you know, early June to get it in, then it's just positive overload. So get started and knock some of the uh, ones out, uh, but don't, you know, don't cram a whole lot in. Don't do more than uh, four hours of training in a day. Otherwise, you'll forget a lot of it. So try to do spread it out and do about, you know, four to six hours per week. I found that to be the best method for knowledge retention and, and uh, uh, without uh, sacrificing uh, overload. And then obviously, uh, you know, if, if the goal of your training is learning and performance and using the training on the job, which it should be, this is not a compliance training course that you just have to get done uh, to make sure that you you know, use your credit card or log into your system like a security training. This is a professional development training course that's designed to improve your job performance in severe weather warnings and forecasts. So uh, your student though has to be critically engaged in ensuring that you have uh, the direct support and conversations before, during, and after. You need to have uh, direct involvement of your management. What does that mean? Let them know what you're doing, why you're doing this, and what you've learned. Uh, it's really important to have that, re that support and have them have their expectations so that they can uh, clearly define, hey, this is what I'm doing, this is what I need to have, be off to take the training, this, and this is what you're going to get from it. You're going to get a seasoned, uh, or at least a proficient, I guess I shouldn't say seasoned, but a, a proficient warning forecaster that's, that will have some definite improvement. It's been shown that this course improves warning performance, but only if the system works and the student is r really ready and willing to change. That's critical. You can't just fall back on uh, on bad habits or whatever. You have to learn to grow and change. And we do our part as well. We try to put training out there that is going to be directly tied to 
something that will improve you. It's not, we eliminate the fluff, something we just found out was something cool that someone's doing, but something that is, has specific, uh, has specifically been shown the operationally, uh, relevant training. So it all has to work together. If one, one of these is, is out of whack, then it's going to be very difficult to A, complete the course, or B, have, uh, have improvement. And we do our job as well to provide health contacts through the course of the event of the uh, of the uh, of the walk, including uh, answering emails or phone calls. I don't have the phones, but you can look look us all up if you have any questions. You can also send general questions to the walk help list on core and severe as a list flash flood as well, uh, since many of you are taking flash flood during this year. So this course will continue uh, through the year. Uh, the severe forecast challenge as well, uh, contacts Chris or Steve, uh, cause they'll be, uh, providing updates and, and you'll need to get a hold of them if you've got problems with that. But we're all kind of work as a team to make sure walk goes, goes, goes off smoothly. All right, everyone have a great day and great spring.